Good afternoon. Um, I'm Barbara Bodine, and I had the privilege to serve as the director of the School of Foreign Services Institute for the Study of Diplomacy, and also to serve as uh, host for this afternoon's event with the Honorable Jane D. Hartley, our former ambassador to France and Monaco, um, who will speak on the subject of the US, France, and the EU, and where do we go from here. ISD was established almost 40 years ago with the twin missions of enhancing and expanding the understanding of the role and the conduct of diplomacy as the core tool of national policy, and also to serve as a bridge between the world and the work of the practitioner and that of the scholar. As part of the, those twin missions, ISD hosts a series of lectures with senior practitioners on critical foreign policy issues. Today's lecture is a part of that, and both our speaker and her topic reflect these goals. The Iden Lectures on American Foreign Policy are supported by a gift from SFS alum, class of, 12, uh, of 1924, uh, <laughs> and no, he's not with us today, Oscar Iden and his wife, and his wife. The series was established in 1970. It says something about the loyalty and dedication of alums to the school. The series was established in 1976 and has hosted a very broad and very diverse range of major players in US policy making and implementation. We have hosted Ben Rhodes, Jane Harmon, William Perry, Brent Scowcroft, George H.W. Bush in his CIA incarnation. And if I were to sit, stand here and read the full list, I would blow through the ambassador's time. Today's event, is co-sponsored by the BMW Center for German and European Studies and the center's director, Jeffrey Anderson, who has just arrived. Um, thank you very much, Jeff. We really appreciate your support. And was arranged in cooperation with the uh, invaluable assistance of Gary Hayes, who I know to be a proud Hoya and an even prouder Hoya parent. So thank you. Following Ambassador Hartley's lecture, Ambassador Nancy McEldowney, a colleague and friend from the Foreign Service, and now as director of the MSFS program, a colleague and friend here at SFS, Nancy will moderate a conversation with Ambassador Hartley, and we will then take your questions and comments. I'll probably provide a little bit more on Gary and Nancy a bit later. ISD's mission is, as I said, to, to act as a bridge between the scholar's world and the extraordinary scholarship here at Georgetown and the world of the policymaker, many of whom live and work not far beyond our gates. Our mission reflects that of the school itself, and who better to serve as our dean than Joel Hellman. Joel came to SFS following 25 years working on some of the most complex issues of governance, conflict, and political economy in the developing world as both a scholar and a practitioner. He served at the World Bank in a number of senior roles, including director of the Center for Conflict, Security, and Development in Nairobi, Kenya, and coordinated the bank's response to the Asian tsunami. Prior to that, he was with the European Bank for Reconstruction and, and Development, working on post-Soviet economic reform in Russia, Central Asia, and Eastern Europe. A graduate of Williams College and Columbia University in Oxford, he was a professor of the politics of economic reform at Harvard. As I said, a true scholar practitioner. Um, I would like to turn it over to Joel right now uh, to make a few remarks. Joel? Thanks very much, Barbara, for that kind introduction. You know, as, as Dean of the School of Foreign Service in these very, very interesting times, um, people will often say to me, well, you know, young people are no longer interested in the diplomatic service. And to those I say, we've got a full house here tonight. <laughs> I mean, I have seen extraordinary interest 
an extraordinary commitment, indeed a renewal um, of interest in the core global problems that we're facing today through um, the Foreign Service and through the ambassadorial core. And when we brought um, people like Ambassador Hartley to um, our campus, there's just been extraordinary interest and I'm, I'm thrilled to see it. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to begin the program today. First, let me say a word of thanks to Gary Hayes um, of Russell Reynolds Associates because in addition to being a proud Hoya, a proud Hoya parent, a supporter and enthusiastic, um, uh, really initiator of our Wall Scholars um, effort, he also helped suggest this event and brought this event to us and brought enormous assistance, so we really appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank the BMW Center and Jeff Anderson for co-sponsoring um, this event. It's critical um, that the center and their students have never lost sight of the fact that Europe has been and will remain the cornerstone of American foreign policy and has been a critical part of this school's history. Um, and we're so pleased to have the BMW Center with us. Um, I also want to welcome our many, many distinguished guests here. We've got colleagues from the World Bank, senior colleagues from the private sector. We've got a, a really a remarkable uh, number of members from the US State Department here, which is wonderful. In fact, there are so many here that I, I actually sort of suspect that the rumors of the halls of the State Department being empty um, may actually be true um, as a result of this event. Um, and I'm also thrilled, as I said, to see the many students here who've come to show their interest and engagement on transatlantic issues on France, Europe, and the ambassadorial service. So welcome, all of you. Our guest this afternoon, Ambassador Jane Hartley, is, is only the most recent in in a distinguished and some would say truly awesome line of envoys, ministers, and ambassadors that this country has sent to France. Our first diplomat, Benjamin Franklin. Two founding presidents, Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe, and more recently, David Bruce, Douglas Dillon, Chip Bowl, and Sergeant Trifer, Pamela Harriman, um, and your immediate uh, predecessor, of course, Charles Rivlin. What an extraordinary list of former envoys to France. It's actually reading through America's diplomatic history. It must be daunting to walk into the office each morning with that list of ghosts looking over your shoulder. Um, but why such a line of the great and the powerful to such a critical post? Because it's France. If the British refer to their American cousins, then our bond with the, the French and with France is that of brothers, of siblings indeed. France is why we as a country are here. The philosophic roots of our revolution and our republic lie in France as much um, as they do in British political theory. France's decision to side with the upstarts in material and meaningful ways of the long course of the war was critical. France's decision to stay on the side of the Union during that second great test of the young republic. These are the roots of the revolution and the republic lie in the success of this young country's experiment. So a common set of values and principles, aspirations and ambitions are what bring our countries together. We do not share a common language. Don't even ask me about my French, and certainly not my strong suit. But we do share common bonds and a common history. And we speak a common language of ideas and principles. And like brothers or siblings, despite those shared roots, from the past and visions for the future, we do have and we seek and insist on our own identities and our own way of doing things. We fight, we disagree, we're sometimes quite disagreeable, but we're simultaneously proud of and jealous of, other goods for, of others' good fortune, each other's good fortune, um, but we are there when needed. Both of our countries have just experienced unprecedented elections and have brought to office unprecedented politicians who challenge each in his own way, basic assumptions and basic structures of how we govern ourselves and how we deal with each other and with the broader global challenges we face. And our two leaders cannot be more different um, than each other. But in a strong family, siblings fight, they jostle, they complain. But at the end of the day, they come together on those common principles, common values, common aspirations, and a common history. How we sort this out, if we can sort this out, what the topography of our relations will be going forward is critically important to each of us, to our allies in Europe and beyond, 
and to our adversaries in Europe and beyond. This will be a test of American diplomacy. And what better time, what better topic, and what better speaker could we have to take us through the thicket of the US, France, and EU than our honored and indeed honorable guest, the former ambassador to France, Jane Hartley. So we welcome you here. We will look forward to your remarks and we'll ex be excited to have the discussion. So thank you very much for being. So anyway, thank you, Dean, very much for those remarks. Um, I'd like to introduce with a little bit more detail uh, Gary Hayes, who you've heard about a couple of times. Again, third time, Proud Hoya, Proud Hoya parent. Um, and um, also, very importantly, the chair of the Wall Scholars Initiative. Um, Gary has a PhD in counseling psychology from Columbia. Uh, as well as a VSFS from Georgetown. Um, he's a member of Russell Reynolds Leadership and Success Succession Practice, um, and he's brought his understanding of the need to identify, develop, and support next generation leaders back to Georgetown in his role and his support for the Walsh Scholars. I want to thank you, Gary, for everything that you continue to do for the school and for the students, and again, for your role in today's event. Gary? Well, I am a proud Hoya, and when I see this room, it makes me very proud uh, to be here and to be uh, living part of what I experienced when I was in the School of Foreign Service. My career has taken many, many paths from when I thought I would join the Foreign Service, indeed from when I interned at the American Embassy in New Delhi to becoming a psychologist and then be a management consultant. But the commitment to public service and the commitment to what Georgetown can be around that issue is something that every Hoya can take with them. So I want to thank Barbara and all her team for creating a platform that we could bring to you today. Uh, it's a great opportunity as an alum to work with such fantastic members of the university who can engage and execute and bring forward a program like today. So Barbara, thank you very much and to all your team as well. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce Jane Hartley, our immediate former ambassador to both the French Republic and the Principality of Monaco. I've known Ambassador Hartley for many years, working with her on both the private and public side of boards. She even hosted my book signing in New York. So that, that truly was a mark of friendship. <laughs> Jane served as ambassador to the French Republic and Monaco from 2014 until 2017, during some of the most difficult times for France. We all saw them in the news. We all saw them uh, every day in the newspaper. And she will talk about that. She was confirmed to both posts by the US Senate in September of 2014. Jane had a very, very interesting career prior to her ambassadorship. Previously, she was the chief executive officer and the founding principal of the Observatory Group. It's an international economic and political advisory firm providing analysis of key government policies as they affect global capital markets. Before funding the founding the Observatory Group, Ms. Hartley was the chief executive officer of the G7 Group. As CEO, she built G7 into a premier research firm providing macroeconomic and political analysis to investors in global markets. The G7 Group put together a network of global policymakers and distributed analysis to most of the central bankers and finance ministers, as well as financial institutions. So again, bridging public service and private uh, economics. Jane currently serves as the member of the visiting committee at the Kennedy School at Harvard, which we don't hold against her, as well as the executive committee of the Dean's Council. She is also a member of the board of trustees of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Jane is a member of the board of overseers at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. 
Ms. Hartley was a presidential appointee to the Board of Directors of the Corporation for National and Community Service, which is the agency within the government that funds all volunteerism other than the Peace Corps. So AmeriCorps and VISTA and Teach for America, all of it is funded under that agency and the board that she helped lead. She was also been a member of the Board of Trustees of Hydrogen Struggles, a member and Board of Trustees of Sesame Workshop, which is Sesame Street, and Vice Chairman, Trustee, and member of the Executive Committee of the Economics Club of New York. Previously, Ms. Hartley filled several positions in the telecommunications industry. She was Vice President and Station Manager for WWOR, an independent television station owned by Universal Studios. She was also Vice President for Marketing for MCA Broadcasting and Outside Director for Pinelands, an MCA subsidiary. Also a Vice President of Corporate Communications at Westinghouse, again, moving private to public, public to private. Before becoming involved in the telecommunications industry, Ms. Hartley was involved in the public sector, serving at the highest levels of government. She worked at the White House in the Carter administration in the Office of Public Liaison with responsibilities that included working with and mobilizing outside constituency groups to support presidential policies. In this capacity, Ms. Hartley worked closely with mayors and governors, as well as with the business community. She was Director of Congressional Relations at the Department of Housing and Urban Development and worked with the Secretary of HUD and members of Congress to advance legislative proposals. She also managed the congressional staff. She has been a busy lady as well as a devoted wife and mother, and not of Georgetown Hoyas, but of very, very fascinating adult children. Jan graduated from Boston College, or Newton College then, and we are honored and delighted to have her here at our Jesuit University to recount some of the memorable challenges and events during her tenure as ambassador, as well as her thoughts on diplomatic service and indeed public service in today's challenging world. I give you Ambassador Jane Hartley. Thank you very much. Bonjour. <laughs> thank you. I, first of all, I particularly want to thank uh, Barbara, Joel, and my friend uh, Gary Hayes. Uh, Gary and I uh, worked together on two different boards I was on. I was a director, as he said, of Hydric and Struggles, the big executive global search firm, uh, where Gary was an important advisor to us. And when I went on the board of the Corporation for National and Community Service, appointed by uh, President Obama, I asked Gary to come in to help us, uh, and he did. So the, my first call after I got back from France was from Gary. I still remember it was a cold day in, uh, in New York. I think it was probably maybe March. I, I was snowing. And he said, you've got to come speak at Georgetown. <laughs> so I said, deal. <laughs> as I said to many things when I got back, thinking maybe he would forget it, but <laughs> absolutely not. I mean, he is absolutely a proud parent and a proud boy and very committed uh, to the wonderful work that Georgetown does. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share with you some reflections uh, from my service as US ambassador to France and Monaco on the importance of the US uh, importance, I'm sorry, of the U.S. and French alliance and some of the key challenges that we faced. Now, most of my speech uh, will be reflections of my time in France, uh, but I know we have Q&A after, and I would be more than happy to discuss uh, the new president of France, President Macron, uh, his new direction for France, uh, what that means to Europe, what that means to the U.S., the, the, the Trump-Macron relationship, really anything uh, that you'd like in Q&A. But this speech is going to be mainly my own personal reflections. Serving as ambassador to France was the honor of a lifetime. It all started with a phone call from the White House. I had been a strong supporter of President Obama. But at the time, I had no aspirations to serve in the administration, and then in early fall 2013, the phone rang. It was a senior White House official with a question. 
Would I be interested in serving as ambassador? I said, where? France. <laughs> so that's not a question you get every day. Still, I had to think about it. I loved my job running an international consulting firm in New York. My family was in New York. My husband, Ralph, was running an investment banking firm and couldn't leave his job. And our oldest child had just finished business school in New York and was to start the next chapter of her life. But at the same time, my parents had always taught me that we were lucky to be living in the greatest country on earth and that the highest honor is to serve your nation. Having served in the Carter administration, including at the White House, I had a deep appreciation for public service. And having worked many years with global companies and financial institutions, including in Paris, where I'd come to know many of the French leaders, both in government and in business, I thought I perhaps had something to offer. So my family and I talked it over. We knew it wouldn't be easy, but Ralph, Kate, and our son Jamie, who interestingly had just moved to London, so he was particularly supportive because he knew I would be living in a very nice house. <laughs> but Ralph, Kate, and Jamie were extremely supportive, and we felt we would make it work. And of course, this was not just any country. This was France. So it didn't take me very long, and my answer was an enthusiastic yes. The months that followed were a total whirlwind. When you're, when you're being considered for a position that requires Senate confirmation, the vetting is intense. They look into every part of your life. I complied with ethics rules and completely separated from my business interests and all my, my board memberships because that's how we did it then. <laughs> <laughs> President Obama announced my nomination in June, in June 2014. In fact, he announced it on D-Day. A month later, I was appearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. By October, Vice President Biden was swearing me in at the White House, and I thought to myself, this is really happening. It was incredibly humbling, and the sense of history was not lost on me. As you heard a few minutes ago, France is our oldest ally. Our first two ambassadors to France, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, arrived in Paris some 240 years ago. And since then, some 60 Americans had served in that position. Among them, giants like David Bruce, Douglas Dillon, Sergeant Shriver, Felix Rowett, and I always admired in particular Pamela Harriman, the first woman to serve in that position. And I was proud to be the first American-born woman to serve in that capacity. I will confess, from citizen to ambassador, that transition can be absolutely dizzying. So my husband and I flew to Paris overnight. I barely slept. When we got off the plane, we were swarmed by cameras and photographers. And that's the photo that appeared all over French TV and the front pages of the newspapers. Me exhausted, a little disheveled, no makeup. <laughs> Not quite the first impression I was hoping to make. And nothing prepares you for the sheer size and majesty of the ambassador's residence, Hotel de Pontalba, a 19th century ma mansion on Rue Faubourg Saint Honore in the heart of Paris. It's quite astonishing. And at 60,000 square feet, it's even bigger than the White House. In fact, when President Obama came to Paris and stayed with me, he looked around and said, this is some house. <laughs> I felt a little guilty, and I answered and said, yours is too. <laughs> anyway, suddenly you're all surrounded by a huge embassy team. In the case of France, a team of about 1,000, and not just from the State Department, but from agencies across the US government. 
uh, in our, at, our, at our main embassy and at our cons consulates across the country. And these incredible men and women, and here I want to give a particular shout out to my DCM, as we call it, Deputy Chief of Mission, Azra Zaya. These incredible women and men had my back every single day, and I am so grateful to each and every one of them. But perhaps the greatest sign that your life is changing is when you, be when you become an ambassador is the security. From the moment Ralph and I got off the plane, and every moment thereafter until I got on the plane to come back, a security, deal was, a security detail was by my side. And it did take some getting used to. One of the first nights in Paris, Ralph and I wanted to go out for dinner. So I told the embassy staff we'd just take a taxi, which sent them into utter panic. <laughs> One staffer looked at me, looked in my eyes and said, you're an ambassador now. You can't take a taxi. So I became, began my tenure as ambassador. I had always loved France and knew from my previous work how important a partner they were. Still, serving as an ambassador gave me an even deeper appreciation of the true strength of our, our alliance. The ideas of the Enlightenment centered in France helped inspire the American Revolution and the ideals that Thomas Jefferson wrote into the Declaration of Independence. As we just said, George Washington and the Continental Army could not have won at Yorktown without Lafayette and French forces by their side. In my visits to Normandy to mark the anniversary of D-Day, what the French call Georgie, I saw the enduring gratitude of the French people for our alliance in World War II. Driving up the coast of La Manche for miles and miles and miles, village after village, houses were draped with French and American flags. Old men and women still tell stories about the GIs who liberated them. Young people recount tales told by their grandparents. Standing there one D-Day, looking out over what President Obama called this tiny sliver of sand upon which hung more than the fate of war, but really the course of human history. Seeing the cemetery at Colby sur Mer, where thousands of Americans rest in peace, and watching the French people welcome back our veterans. Our veterans still come, now in their 90s. It's overwhelming. It truly gives you chills. And that commitment, that sense that we're in this together, is mutual. Dur during one of our ceremonies at D-Day, an American vet was invited to speak he was from Lexington, Kentucky, and he was 89 years old. But he was still spry and still feisty. So he got up and he said, I've heard France is having some challenges, but if you need me, I can come back. I'm still pretty tough. <laughs> and as an American and as a New Yorker who was in Manhattan on 9-11, I still remember how French friends stood with us after that attack on our country. We will never forget how Le Monde declared, nous sommes tous American. We are all American. I felt these bonds of friendship every summer when we opened the residence, America's house in Paris, to the French people as we celebrated both Fourth of July and their Bastille Day. It was always a reminder that our two great republics are bound not just by common interest, but by our shared commitment to universal values, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for us, liberté, égalité, fraternité for France. And because we're guided by common values, France is not simply our oldest ally, it's also one of our closest and strongest allies. And during my time as ambassador, our two countries made progress on a whole range of issues. Under President Obama's leadership and the tireless efforts of Secretary John Kerry, we showed the power of diplomacy. We worked hard to sustain sanctions on Russia 
because of its aggression against Ukraine. The United States and EU and our partners, including France, reach a deal that is preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon, something that I think is critically important to the peace of the world going forward. At the landmark COP21 conference in Paris, one of the moments closest to my heart, nearly 200 nations agreed to the most ambitious agreement in history to combat climate change. We also worked closely with US and French business communities to sustain, sustain one of America's largest trade relationships with some billions of dollars in commerce between us every day and French firms in the US supporting some 500,000 American jobs. And even as our nations confronted these urgent issues, we pressed ahead with our day-to-day -day work, often 18-hour days, but important, work that strengthened the ties between our people. In particular, I look for ways to reaffirm the cultural bonds, including our shared love of food, music, and the arts. And that was so central to our friendship. I made and kept a pledge to visit and convey America's commitment to every region of France. We helped bring the art of Jeff Koons to the Pompidou, the cuisine of chefs like Thomas Keller of the French Laundry to French palates. We welcomed the New York Philharmonic, Wynton Marsalis, and the Kennedy Center, showcasing all the time the best of American music, art, and film. And I was proud to stand up for the values that we share, including the equality of all people, when I was the only foreign ambassador to join the mayor of Paris and thousands of Parisians in their pride march to the, defend the rights of LGBT. Along this joy, however, my time in Paris was marked by far too much tragedy. Indeed, if there was one challenge that dominated my time in Paris, it was terrorism and the barbarism, barbarisms unleashed by ISIL. I served as ambassador for 28 months from October until the end of the administration, January, for me, 19th, 2017. And those 28 months coincided with a terrible surge of attacks in France and around the world that shook our nations and tested our diverse multicultural societies. I had only been in Paris a few months. It was a Wednesday morning. I was leaving the residence to get in my car to head to the embassy at which point my guards quickly ushered me back indoors. Just two, mi just two miles away, two gunmen had burst into the offices of Charlie Hebdo, the satirical newspaper, angered by the, its portrayal of Islam, and started shooting. The gunman was still on the loose, but I insisted that we go to the embassy to account for our staff and connect with French officials to provide whatever assistance we could. And like people around the world, we watched the carnage unfold in real time on television. In one horrific image, a wounded policeman lay defenseless on the sidewalk, his hands up, at which point one of the terrorists murdered him at point blank range. By the time it was over, 12 people had been killed. And in the next days, another gunman killed a policewoman, and the day after that, attacked a kosher supermarket in a vile act of anti-Semitism and murdered four innocent hostages. It was horrifying. People were in shock. Many wondered, how could this happen in, an all, in of all places, the city of light? And then 10 months later, it happened again. It was November 13th, 2015, a Friday night. I was at a restaurant with my husband when the security deal, detail rushed in to the table and insisted that we leave immediately. We didn't know the details, whether it was criminal or terrorism, but we know, knew that the gunmen were on the loose. So we rushed back to the residence and to the safe room. I spent much of that first night on the phone on the phone with our embassy, accounting for our people, 
on the phone with the French, making sure that our intelligence and security teams were coordinating with them, and on the phone with Secretary, Secretary Kerry and the White House. In the awful hours that followed, we learned the full scope of the horror. Three teams of gunmen had attacked sites across the city, and these were coordinated attacks. First, an attack outside a soccer game, Stade de France. Soon after, shootings at cafes on the right bank. And finally, a massacre at Bataclan Theater in the middle of a concert by an American heavy metal band. All told, 130 people were killed, including an American student named Naomi Gonzalez, who was just 23 years old. Over 400 people were wounded. It was the deadliest attack in France since World War II. And whereas Charlie Hebdo and the kosher supermarket were targeted attacks, November 13 was more like 9-11, an attack against all of us and really against a way of life. And it struck very, very close to home. It seemed that just about everybody at the embassy especially our local French employees, knew someone who was killed or injured. We brought in grief counselors and psychologists. Yet I, even as we grieved, our team worked round the clock, helping families find their loved ones, advising Americans in France how to keep safe, and most importantly, ensuring that we are working side by side with the French. It was another five days before the ringleader was cornered and killed. Staff at the embassy brought in cots, rested in hallways, slept in hallways, and basically pretty much for an entire week, much of the embassy did not sleep at all. The French government imposed a state of emergency and thousands of troops fanned out across the country. President Hollande declared, we are at war. The following summer, terror struck once more, this time on Bastille Day. Down in Nice, along the waterfront, tens of thousands of people, many of them families, had gathered to watch the fireworks along the promenade, a place I'd visited many times myself with my children when they were young. As the fireworks ended, a driver in a 19-ton truck started plowing through the crowd at high speed, hitting everyone he could until he was finally shot dead by police. 86 innocent men, women, and children, including three Americans, were mowed down. More than 400 were injured. And alongside these major attacks, there were also smaller ones, threats just about every other week in Nice, Three, children, uh, three uh, policemen protecting a Jewish community center were stabbed. Outside Lyon, an attacker, attacker set off an explosion at a gas factory. In Normandy, two gunmen stormed a church and murdered an 85-year-old priest. And this threat of terrorism from groups like ISIL and Al-Qaeda truly presented and presents, I think, our countries with the fundamental challenge. The question we face is not only how do we stay safe, but in the face of this terror, how do we stay strong, free, united as diverse, multicultural societies? And I believe that the unity and resolve that we witnessed during my time as ambassador can be somewhat of a guide. First and foremost, we have to make sure that our countries are cooperating as closely as possible, including sharing as much intelligence and law enforcement information as possible. Whenever I was in a security or an intelligence briefing, my first two questions always were, have we told the French, and are the French sharing with us? And in fact, after Bataclan and Charlie, we shared information even more quickly, I think preventing many more attacks and perhaps saving many lives. And today, France remains one of our closest and strongest military and counterterrorism partners, as we see from their activity even now in Sahel and in the Middle East. 
we have to reject any claim that terrorists like ISIL represent a class of clash of civilizations or a war between religions. They threaten all of us, including Muslims. And that police officer killed on the sidewalk outside Charlie Hebdo, he was a Muslim. At the kosher market, the worker who saved the lives of some of the customers, Jews and Christians hiding behind his counter, he was a Muslim. And he saved them because he said, we are brothers. And that is exactly why we need to affirm those universal values that we share. That's why after Charlie Hebdo, I joined the march of more than one million people in Paris to stand up for freedom of the press, press and to declare, declare Je suis Charlie. That's why after Bataclan, we lit up the embassy right on the Place de Concorde with John Kerry in the tricolors of the French flag. And as soon as he landed in Paris for the climate conference, in the middle of the night, literally it was 1 AM, President Obama and I went out to Bataclan, and he laid a single white rose in front of the theater. And it's also why I went down to Nice after the Bastille Day attack to meet with the families. The Leslie family had lost their only son, Nicholas, a 20-year-old student at Berkeley. Kim Copeland had lost her husband and her son Brody, just 11 years old. Kim showed me pictures on her camera of the family together, including little Brody standing at a candy stand holding up a bag of treats just minutes before he was killed. It was by far the single hardest day of my time as ambassador. As a wife, as a mother, I could not even imagine to begin, begin to imagine their pain. But I felt it was important to go and show America's solidarity, just as President Hollande and Prime Minister Valls had come to the embassy to show France's support for us after Orlando. Because in the face of terrorism, we can't give in to fear or frankly change our way of life, because that's exactly what the terrorists want. After Charlie and after Bataclan, I saw the same spirit in Paris that I'd seen in New York after 9-11. Grit, perseverance, and a refusal to be defeated. One morning after Bataclan, I went for a walk. The streets were beautiful with holiday decorations, but totally empty and eerily quiet. So I made a point to sit outside at a cafe right on Place de Madeleine. And soon, after a couple of hours, maybe not that much, an hour and a half, more Parisians joined me, proud and defiant in their own way. And in the days that followed, we saw what makes France, France. Because the city of light refused to go dark. People came together to sing the Marseillaise, and as one Parisian said to me, Paris will always be Paris. So in contrast to terrorists who want to divide us, we need to come together across faiths and across backgrounds. And when I was ambassador, we hosted what I'm told was the first public Hanukkah celebration ever held at the residence. But we didn't just invite Jewish leaders, we invited leaders of all religions, including Muslim leaders. After that, people thought it was such a great idea. We also hosted what I'm told was the first iftar and did the same thing. With all the terror and tensions, I felt it was important for these communities to know that it was America, America, who stood with them, all of them, including one important principle, freedom of religion. And the sight of these faith leaders coming together, sharing each other's sacred traditions, brought tears to my eyes. And it was a reminder that mutual respect and understanding are still possible. In all our countries, we have to create more opportunity and hope for communities that have been left behind, like the struggling suburbs of Paris, where high unemployment 
makes too many young people easy prey for ISIL. We have to make sure that our economies and our societies are more inclusive, that every young person knows they have a place in our country and have a chance to succeed. At the embassy, that's why we created a program called Yes We Can, an inter internship program that sponsored scholarships to help young people develop their skills. And we recruited businesses to do many things. Uh, in one case, we rec recruited businesses to fund sports facilities, which in Paris are not funded at all. And I'm, since I'm a huge sports fan, people at Georgetown might, might uh, respect that or at least agree. We actually uh, got private sector and the MBA to build basketball courts, once again, in some of these tougher areas. And Kareem Abdul-Jabbar came over to speak with the kids uh, when we inaugurated these, about the, pro the importance of hope, determination, and resilience. We organized job fairs. We did one that I'm particularly proud of. It was called Jobs for All, and it was to connect young people from disadvantaged communities with major French and American companies. Basically, the 24 biggest companies in France, roughly 12 American and 12 French, decided that they would be willing to be part of this program. They had never done anything like this before. And I credit the State Department with this uh, because it was a grant from the State Department that made it happen. And I'll never forget the young woman at one of these job fairs in her 20s, a Muslim, who said, normally, because of my name and where I live, I can't even get an interview. But today, here I am talking to GE, Facebook, and Disney. So thank you to the State Department for what we would call very important soft diplomacy. But moments like that are why I am able to look back on my time as ambassador with great pride. Pride in the men and women of our US mission across the country, true patriots who advance our interest and protect our security, and pride in how they performed with such skill and grace in some very dark days in the face of terror and loss. Pride in the opportunity to have served President Obama and Secretary Kerry, and to have shown the people of France, and I think hopefully the world, the best of America and what we stand for. For freedom, for opportunity, for the dignity of every human being. I truly believe that we handed off the baton, when we handed off the baton, the Franco-American relationship was as strong as it's ever been. And today I'm asked to assess the current relationship, which I will talk about more in Q&A, between our two countries and what I think the future holds for that alliance. On the one hand, the challenges are obvious. President Trump openly supported Marine Le Pen for the pr French presidency and the election of Emmanuel Macron, who I know and admire, was a welcomed firewall against the brash populism and reckless nationalism championed by Trump and Le Pen. And we've seen those differences manifested in the Trump administration's policy choices. And I, for one, believe it was a tragic mistake for the US to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. And I don't agree with the administration's positions on trade, immigration, or refugees. France doesn't agree, nor does most of Europe. I'm also deeply concerned that the administration's willful neglect of the State Department, leaving huge numbers of senior positions unfilmed, unfilled with plummeting morale, and an exodus of very, very talented civil servants is un and that is undermining our nation's ability to lead in Europe and in around the world. And quite simply, I think it makes the world less safe. As Secretary of Defense Mattis famously said back when he was a Marine general, if you don't fully fund the State Department, then I need to buy more ammunition. That said, I do have some hope President Macron is deeply committed to our transatlantic alliance and to strengthening the EU. President Trump's Bastille Day visit to Paris seemed to go smoothly, even with those handshakes. <laughs> and I do believe that the fundamentals of our alliance remain strong. That doesn't mean, though, that Macron won't state his opposition, as he did last week at the UN, 
to U.S. positions on Iran, North Korea, climate, among others. We have some common interests, common interests for sure in defeating ISIL and stabilizing the Middle East in opposing Russian aggression and standing up, hopefully, and standing up for human freedom and dignity. And it's our institutions, our military, our intelligence professionals, our diplomats, who are still working together, although perhaps not as closely as before. But I do believe that with some bumps for sure, our alliance will stay strong because our commitment to each other, and not just between governments, but between our peoples. And I'm going to end on a slightly hopeful note. I, I saw this spirit in the summer of 2015. It was a Friday night, and I was traveling in France when I received a call from the French National Security Advisor. There had been yet another act, attack on a high-speed train to Paris. People were hurt but no one had been killed, <coughs> thanks to the heroic acts of several passengers, including three young Americans. Spencer Stone, Alex Carlados, and Anthony Sadler, friends since grade school, now in their early 20s, were on vacation together in Europe. Riding on the train, they suddenly heard screams and saw a gunman cocking an AK-47. Alex, a National Guardsman, said, let's go, and they charged and tackled the gunman. They fought hand to hand. They ripped away the weapon, but the gunman also had a knife, and he stabbed Spencer, an enlistee in the Air Force. He stabbed Spencer in the neck and in the hand. But finally, these three young Americans in shorts and T-shirts overpowered the attacker. Another passenger was shot in the neck, and despite his serious wounds, Spencer, a medic, stopped the bleeding and saved the passenger's life. After getting that first phone call from the French National Security Advisor, my focus turned to Spencer, Alec, and Anthony. They were just kids far from home, and I wanted to make sure they were safe and getting everything they needed. Spencer was wounded in the hospital, but soon released. We brought over their families from the United States and put them up in the residence so they could be close to their sons. And two days later, we held a press conference. Spencer, Alec, and Anthony had faced down a terrorist, but the idea of facing the global media terrified them. They were nervous. But with poise and humility, they won the hearts of the French people. Spencer said at the press conference, the gunman was ready to fight to the end. But he added, so were we. So after the press conference, President Obama and Vice President uh, Biden both called the three young men. Uh, after that, I said to them, so you've now talked to the president and you've talked to the vice president. Is there anything else I can do for you? <laughs> they had an answer, though. They said, yes, we'd really like to meet Kobe Bryant. <laughs> I couldn't make it up, <laughs> and they did. Uh, but the next day, the three were presented France's highest honor, the Légion d'honneur. It can often take years for France to grant this recognition, but the decision to award it in a mere couple of days was both a sign of France's deep gratitude and a symbol of our strengthened relationship. At the ceremony, these three young men and their khakis and polo shirts, President Alain pointed to them and pointed out one important fact, that there were more than 500 passengers on that train and that the gunmen had 300 rounds of ammunition. Their heart heroism saved many lives. Faced with the evil of terrorism, President Alain told them, there is a good, the good of humanity, and that is what you embody. So Spencer, Alec, and Anthony do represent the bonds that have united our countries for more than two centuries, from Yorktown to Normandy to the streets of Paris and to Nice. We can never take our liberty for granted. We were in it together then. We are in it together now. And like generations before us, we're called upon to meet the challenge of our time 
with the same undaunted spirit, the good of humanity. So just as they, those three young guys, were willing to defend those values that are universal, we must say, so are we. And I would say, now is a more important time than ever. Thank you very much. Viva la France. God bless America. Thank you. Um, I think you will agree with me that that was a superb talk. Um, and as an American and as a diplomat, uh, thank you. Uh, and those ghosts that were floating around your office, uh, they are very proud. Um, you have done us a great honor and a great service, and so thank you. Um, we certainly have, I think, a much deeper, richer understanding of the dynamics, the, the roots of our relationship with our closest ally and the implications of maintaining this bi bilateral relationship for its own sake, for the region, and for the world. I've asked uh, Nancy McEldowney, uh, my friend and my colleague in many guises, to moderate a, a brief conversation uh, with Ambassador Hartley to expand on some of these themes and explore some of these key points. Um, Nancy came to us only this summer. Thank you, Dean Hellman. Um, as director of the MSFS program, she brings with her a long and highly distinguished career um, as a diplomat and as a foreign service officer. She's been a leading policy advisor on Europe, uh, and she has brought her experience and her expertise to our students who will benefit for many years to come. In addition to her service as director of the Foreign Service Institute, she was ambassador to Bulgaria, senior vice president at the National Defense University, director of European Affairs um, on the White House National Security Staff, and principal deputy assistant secretary of state for European and Eurasian Affairs. Nancy, welcome, welcome again to FSS, SFS, <laughs> sorry. Um, and thank you for serving as moderator this afternoon. Okay, let's get started. Let's get started. Okay, <laughs> hi everybody. Um, I am delighted to have the opportunity to facilitate this conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to begin by amb asking Ambassador Hartley a few questions. I will then look to the audience for questions that you may have. I need to begin though with a comment that picks up on what Ambassador Bodine said. But I think everyone in this room just experienced what thousands of people across France and America experienced throughout her tenure as the leader of the relationship between the United States and one of our most important allies throughout one of the most difficult times in our history. And you did it with enormous strength and vision. She is clearly a leader of compassion and warmth. It is why everyone who worked with you was loyal and trusting, and they rave about her still. She is famous. <laughs> so thank you for everything tell that my children. you did. <laughs> I absolutely will tell your children. But that was, that was a very moving and, and really just tremendously uplifting set of comments. Um, I want to begin, though, with what you promised, which was a little bit about Emmanuel Macron. Oh, yes, absolutely. He is the man of the hour, uh -huh. until just a few months ago, he was completely unknown. He catapulted in a very short period of time uh -huh. to the presidency of France. He, is, he was 38 years old, an investment banker who had never held elected office before. Some are describing him as bold and visionary, 
Others are describing him as brash and, and perhaps unwise. You know him. Tell us a bit mm -hmm. about Macron, the man, his vision, mm -hmm. what you think his chances are of success with this mm -hmm. very ambitious agenda he's laid out. I, I do know Emmanuel Macron. I met him uh, when I was ambassador, and he was minister of economy. He had been minister of the economy in France. He had been economic advisor. He had been a banker at Rothschild, and um, briefly, he's, he's 39. He didn't do anything for a very long, but very smart man. And he became an economic advisor to President Hollande, left the, the government very briefly, and then came back as economic minister. Um, that's when I worked with him. That's how I got to know him. Uh, I, am, I am a fan. I, I admire him. I think he's. Uh, I think he will, uh, and he's trying to bring France in the right direction. I do want to talk a little about the election, though, because it really. Uh, and, and if people don't know it, they should look at it. Really, it really was uh, pretty groundbreaking. Uh, he's, Emmanuel Macron set up his own party on Mars uh, just a year before the before he won as as president. Everybody thought he was running for the next time. In France, the president's every five years, so we were sh everybody was sure he was running for the next time. Not only did he win the presidency as an independent against two, uh, and if you can uh, include Marine, Marine, Marine Le Pen, three parties and two establishment parties, the Socialist Party and the Republican Party. Um, he won that, and then he went on to win the governmental elections, including the National Assembly, which is the most important political body in France for getting legislation. Nobody thought he can do, could do that. He's, he's a very savvy, uh, he's a savvy politician. But what I do admire about him is when he ran, and he ran you know, when populism, we thought, remember, was sweeping Europe. Uh, Emmanuel Macron did not back down from any of his positions in running. He stayed true to pro-EU, pro-NATO, pro-diversity, and he and I worked a lot on the Jobs for All program that we talked about, pro-climate. Um, he ran who he, who he was. Now, uh, just like many of our presidential candidates or, or any candidate, any political candidate, he had some luck. The socialist um, veered quite far to the left in their nominee. The Republicans nominated somebody that caught caught in the scandal, uh, but Macron was pretty brilliant in this campaign, and he ran pretty much right up the center. I, I did a little mini focus group when I was still ambassador um, with my security. I had a fairly large security team, and they were all ex-policemen. Um, and I asked them who they were going to vote for, and I wasn't exactly sure. I was expecting some Marine Le Pen. Many of them said they were going to vote for Emmanuel Macron. And I said, why? They said, change. Um, so I'm, I'm impressed uh, by what he's done politically. I'm impressed by what he's trying to do. And the first big piece of legislation is going to be labor reform. Uh, and I think he's done it pretty well up to now. It, I also think it's important that he succeed. I think it's important for Europe. I think it's important for the United States. Excellent. Well, there are many who agree, <laughs> although he certainly has a lot of critics. Yes. And Macron made a historic speech recently, and he stepped into the historic Sorbonne University at a time of tremendous challenge in Europe. Mm -hmm. There is the migration crisis. Europe is still reeling from the Eurozone uh, debt crisis. There are the political explosions of what happened in terms of the German election, mm -hmm. and we can come mm -hmm. to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. But it's a time of tremendous turmoil mm -hmm. in Europe. Mm -hmm. And Macron stepped on the stage and said, the answer to Europe's problems is more Europe mm -hmm. in the sense of a stronger mm -hmm. European mm -hmm. Union, Absolutely. tighter cohesion in the mm -hmm. institutions, mm -hmm. proposing some very mm -hmm. radical mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. for, for the Europeans, mm -hmm. which is a commission mm -hmm. that is smaller mm -hmm. than the 28 member nations, mm -hmm. but more effective mm -hmm. with a smaller member population of mm -hmm. just 15 mm -hmm. if he can carry it mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. Can he pull this off? And as you've said, the fate of Europe rests mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. it. 
Mm -hmm. and perhaps the fate of the transatlantic partnership as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the stakes are so mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. And you are right. And Macron gave a speech, uh, I think two days ago, maybe, um, you know, outlining his vision uh, for Europe and went even farther than I thought. I mean, I know him and I know what he felt and I, I uh, know what he campaigned on. But just the other day, I think it was two days ago, he gave a speech talking about having a common military in Europe and having a common budget. Um, and this is something particularly um, on the budget, this has been something that's been tossed around for a long time because everybody knows there's a common currency. Um, and many policymakers have often said you can't have monetary union without having fiscal union, but that governments would never give up their political authority to put together budgets, fiscal authority. So I, I thought it was a pretty bold, bold statement. Can he do it? I think the key thing to watch um, is what he's doing right now, which is labor reform, because one of the things that always um, in the past, even when uh, President Hollande was president, you know, Germany had been pushing France to do more structural reform. France had been pushing Germany to do more stimulus. This is gonna be a key test. I personally think he gets it. Um, probably the, the mo even the maybe more important vote than his being elected president was his winning the National Assembly that nobody thought he could do. Um, and other people have tried labor reform, uh, Prime Minister Valls in particular under President Hollande, and frankly, I was in Paris then, it was a mess. Um, there were weeks and weeks of debate, the bill got totally watered down, there were protests all over the street, streets. Macron has, has done something quite smart. He, he sat down with all the unions in July and August. Only one of the unions came out in opposition. That was not the case before. Uh, he also, uh, the way he's doing it legislatively, he's not allowing the assembly to have a, amendments and things like that, so there's no debate that will be dragged on. The assembly at some point is just gonna have an up and down vote. He has the majority, it will be an up vote. If he does that, okay. I, I think there's, people should be hopeful. Germany could be, I think, <laughs> slightly more difficult because of the election we just saw, even though Merkel has always advocated these positions. Well, hopeful is the theme, and mm -hmm. the Europeans have often said that they tend to go right up to the edge of the cliff, and then they find a solution. And so let's be hopeful about that. Um, I've offered uh, to take some questions from the audience, and I'm looking out to see if I see any hands. Please, sir. Oh, here's a microphone coming, so let's use the microphone. And if you could also please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Jeff Burnham in the government department. Um, could you talk a little more about Macron and Trump? He, he's not just tolerating Trump, he's proactively cultivating him. Uh, and wh what do you think about all of that? I mean, it's, it, it's curious. Yes. And, and let me add to this. We were, we were chatting about this earlier. Macron has been dream, deemed Europe's Trump whisperer. And so let's see if it's the case. Ambassador. I think it's a good question. And, I, and I've got to tell you, I don't personally know the answer. But it's important to watch Macron because you know, at the UN, just I guess the UN was just last week, I think, you know, Trump gave his speech. The next speech up, or close to up, was Macron, who went after Trump, well, went after is not a very elegant way, who disagreed with uh, our policy positions, uh, our administration's policy positions on Iran, on climate, and on North Korea. And, and he said it straight out. So Macron is not changing any of his policies because of Trump. Um, I think perhaps the Bastille Day, and I don't know the answer, it was an opportunity for him to, to be an equal and if, perhaps even to lead, which I think in the end is his aspiration because in Britain there is going to be a lot more, um, uh, Brexit is going to dominate. I mean, there's just no way no way, it's not, and it's going to probably dominate for a long time. So there is going to be a huge discussion internally about how that is structured and what happens, what happens with trade agreements, things like that. 
Merkel at the time that Macron did it was in the middle of an election. I, I think Macron wants to be the leader of Europe with Merkel. He has a good relationship with Merkel, but he definitely, and this was, I think, a positioning. He didn't change his positions, though. My, my French friends like Macron because they see him as a world leader. They he for Stuart France as yeah. a... An important world leader. And that's the Im that's really interesting because that's the image he's trying to portray. And it's it's what many in Europe need so much mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the UK mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. Germany weakened. Exactly. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. There were some student hands uh, right here, please, sir. Thank you. Hi Ambassador, thank you for the conference. Thank you. So my question is what was your connection with France uh, prior to be being appointed a master? Uh, it was mainly from the two firms. I was CEO of, of two different firms. One was called the G7 Group. Uh, we dealt a huge amount with France and with all of Europe uh, and Japan during those days. So I worked pretty closely, more on the economic side, I will say that, pretty closely with the Banque de France, with the East European Central Bank, with various French policymakers um, in government and some in the private sector. Other questions from this side? Please, sir. Here's a microphone. I'm an instructor of consulting at the Graduate School of Georgetown. As Trump seems to be determined to bring the United States into itself, it will leave a vacuum in the rest of the world. Do you think this is an opportunity for the European Union to grow and fill that vacuum? Or what might be the role of the rising nationalism that would uh, upset that? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. I I think it is an opportunity for the EU. I mean, I don't know if anybody has noticed what's been happening economically, but um, you know, the economies of most of the major countries are doing better. The euro has risen considerably. Um, and I think now you also have two leaders that are strongly committed to Europe, uh, Merkel and, and, and Macron. Uh, so I, d I do think it's an opportunity. I do think it's an opportunity. Uh, and that's why I, I keep talking about M President Macron being successful, because I think if you see some of the structural reforms happening in France, you will then see some change in policies in Germany, and it could really be a stimulus across Europe. And having been in France during some of these difficult uh, days, it's also critical, critical, um, that the relationship continue on law enforcement, on intelligence, because, you know, as we know, terrorism does not stop at borders. And when I was there, I did see a huge, huge improvement uh, in, in that area, which is basically timely sharing of information, which when you're dealing with terrorists and terrorist attacks is critical. Mm -hmm. Um, let's stay on the cooperation point for a moment. Mm -hmm. And you've argued very persuasively about the degree to which the United States and France need each other. Mm -hmm. We can't solve our problems unless we have that kind of cooperation. Mm -hmm. In the same way that France and Germany have always needed each other, mm -hmm. and they have been known for many decades as the engine of Europe, and the Franco-German partnership was something that allowed really the grand European experiment when these countries gave up a bit of sovereignty, mm -hmm. but for the greater good to avoid conflict, to advance prosperity, mm -hmm. to serve mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. needs. But there are many who believe that that's now in question. And with the far right alternative for Deutschland party Mm -hmm. in the German parliament, mm -hmm. in the Bundestag, for the first time in many decades, and with Merkel's party mm -hmm. giving its worst showing. So mm -hmm. she has a mandate to govern mm -hmm. for a fourth term, but a very complicated coalition negotiation coming up, and less room to maneuver mm -hmm. as she governs. Mm -hmm. So what's your judgment about how that partnership mm -hmm. can evolve and how Macron can perhaps mm -hmm. step in. Right. It's a little the opposite of what we've seen over the last four years, which was, um, you know, Merkel was very strong in her and had a huge amount of support in Germany. 
um, President Hollande, although very strong on foreign policy, counterterrorism, intelligence. It's interesting in France, you could go into uh, the Minister of Defense, and, and our Ash Carter worked very, very closely with the Minister of Defense. And you know, John Kerry, I think, visited France 35 times, something <laughs> like that. I lost track at some number, but uh, uh, we were really close allies. But when you asked, when you needed something, and they really were great partners militarily, the Charles de Gaulle in the Gulf, something like that. It was amazing how quickly you got an answer, and it was almost, if not always, yes. Um, on the economic side, and this was partly political, partly the structure of the government, President Hollande could not get anything through, and that really was his Achilles heel. Um, that has changed, and I think now what you're probably, I mean, you really need to watch the next couple of months and see once again on this labor bill, but I think you're going to see Macron leading the coalition because he has a lot more freedom because of this National Assembly to lead on things that Alain could not get done. Um, and, and Merkel is going to have a little bit more of it difficult. Yes. But I still think they'll be together. Yes. <laughs> and his vision to say even in the future we'll find another role for the UK in, mm -hmm. the, in the European yes. Union as yes. well, which is yes. really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, other questions from the audience? I'm uh, trying hard to see. There we go. A uh, young lady right here, please. Good afternoon, Ambassador. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, so I was a question, as you mentioned in your speech about terrorism, mm -hmm. we have witnessed like increasing terrorism attack in Europe. So someone said it's closely related to the increasing amount of migrants. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you agree with this or like your attitude towards the current immigrant policy in Europe? Thank you. I, I can speak to France here, um, and in France, no, I do not agree with it. Um, first of all, uh, France does, did not have that many migrants, um, and um, I think to this day does not. I don't remember what the number, but it was, but it was quite small. Um, you know, I had a, and many people agreed with me, I had a personal view of why terrorism in France. I mean, one of it just was kind of, one of the things was kind of obvious, and it always frustrated me when people didn't say it which was France was leading the coalition against ISIL. Mm -hmm. Exactly what we said before. When you asked for the Charles de Gaulle in the Gulf, you got it. Um, and France really leaned forward on counter ISIL and what they were doing in the Sahel, Mali, all the places like that. So if you couple that um, with, um, you know, there is a lar fairly large Muslim pop population, and in some cases, the suburbs of Paris, uh, dis, I think disenfranchised, um, and I think that is something that could have been done, or done better. Alain, the Alain administration was really working on it, but it's things like education, it's things even like transportation, mm -hmm. just making sure that people can get to jobs in Paris. Uh, there are many things that, uh, you know, I think will take a while. But I, I don't, I don't think. It's migrants. No, I, I'm not. Not in France, anyway. I think it was um, France leading the coalition um, with Schengen. You have open borders. That's true of you know many other countries as well. And then you did have uh, a small group uh, in some of these suburbs of a disenfranchised population with particularly high youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions, um, please. Here's a microphone. Until I boom around. Anyway, we have so many students in the room today, and you've described obviously a fascinating time, but one really of quite extreme challenge. Mm -hmm. And with so many students here interested in public service and in foreign service, what, what would you say to them? What would you say about making a life in public service at this point in our country's history? I would say you can make a difference. And you know, as difficult as this time in France, and a little bit why I told you the story, aside from the fact that really it was you know, something that permeated the whole experience, the institution made a difference. The embassy made a difference. The people made a difference. The teams, the teams from the State Department, the teams from the intelligence agency, the teams from law enforcement, 
those teams of people, in my view, saved a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, if, if you're looking at public service, to me, it's the highest calling. It, uh, it always was. Um, I sort of started my career in public service, and I always wanted to end my career in public service. Uh, and in public service, individuals do make a difference. That's fantastic. Uh, one more question here, please. This gentleman here. Hello. The PLO just got recognized by Interpol, and so my question is, some would argue that the PLO is like a conduit into terrorists. Are you, do you think that there is a concern in France about sharing with a group that may pass on the information in the same way that Turkey has been a problem for NATO? You know, I don't. I actually don't know the answer to that. My my feeling would be uh, probably not a concern, but I really don't know the answer. Um, you know, the sharing of information is uh, is something that uh, the French. First of all, the French are much better, I think, than given they get credit in terms of intelligence, in terms of counterterrorism. Um, I dealt a lot with DGSE and with DGSI their internal and external services, and they're really quite good. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I've not heard that concern. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, let me just say that for all of us here, and especially for the students who are here, who are looking at developing their own worldview, mm -hmm. trying to make mm -hmm. sense of mm -hmm. the things that are happening, mm -hmm in this country, around the world, and then to chart their own pathway mm -hmm. forward. You have been a tremendous inspiration. You are a fabulous role model. You have honored us and, and really inspired us. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, OK. Um, <laughs> I was going to make closing remarks, uh, but Nancy just stole all my lines. I'm sorry. Um, um, to thank you for your service, to thank you as a role model to the students uh, for everything that you brought us this afternoon and everything that you have done for our country and this important relationship. Thank you very much, Any. The gift. Small token. The gift. Thank you very uh, much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It doesn't look <laughs> And thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm sure you are as inspired and informed as all of us were. So thank you, and good afternoon. <laughs>